I studied four surviving firms, J.P. Morgan Chase, Goldman Sachs, Wells Fargo, and Toronto Dominion Bank, now TD Bank, which since the crisis has appeared here in Washington on a number of street corners. J.P. Morgan Chase's story is of preparing the company in advance to be strong enough to take advantage of long-term opportunities. Goldman's is a firm-wide systems and capacity to react quickly to changes in the environment and then, of course, tripping heavily over reputational risk. Wells is a company with a culture of customer focus and restraint, and TD Bank provides a simple lesson. If you don't understand it, don't invest in it. Each of these firms applied strong governance, good management, operational competence, and discipline, but with different approaches. Some of these firms have had serious problems since the crisis, and of course, J.P. Morgan Chase actually lost billions of dollars in their London office in an event that reveals poor risk management. But the point here is these firms had successful strategies for weathering the crisis. There is a huge difference between taking a large loss, such as Morgan recently took, and having the company fail. The companies that failed the crisis didn't just take losses. They went out of business, required massive amounts of taxpayer aid, or entered into mergers that ended their existence as independent companies. Unsuccessful firms included Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, Bear Stearns, Lehman, Merrill Lynch, Citigroup, Wachovia, UBS, AIG, Countrywide, IndyMac, and WAMU. With variations, they exhibited similar shortcomings in organization, governance, and management. Many of these institutions had become so unwieldy that they were virtually impossible to manage as integrated enterprises. While managers may have profited from agglomeration into organizations of a trillion dollars in size or more, it's not clear that this massive size benefited market efficiency or the financial system or for firms that failed their shareholders. We forget how large our financial conglomerates actually are. In 2008, Citigroup with 350,000 employees and nearly 2,500 subsidiaries was the largest complex financial institution. AIG, smaller than most of the major firms, comprised some 223 companies that operated in 130 countries and had 116,000 employees. And in my book, I try to share with the reader exactly how complex these firms are. And the AIG org chart, and remember, they're really small compared to our large complex financial institutions, takes up four pages of fine print and a huge number of organizational boxes. Weak governance, compounded organizational shortcomings, overbearing CEOs dominated weak boards that failed to uphold the duty of respectfully challenging management to provide feedback and propose limitations, and probe limitations of proposed management initiatives. Another characteristic of unsuccessful firms was their pursuit of short-term growth without appropriate regard for risk. In 2005 to 2007, both Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac decided to increase their purchases of subprime and all-day mortgages, just as home prices peaked and declined. Other firms, Lehman and WAMU, also decided to increase risk around the same time. Some firms, Countrywide, AIG, Citi, simply continued the blind pursuit of market share without regard to changing market circumstances. So where were the regulators? To say the least, government's actions before the crisis were seriously inadequate to protect against an economic debacle. Not unrelated is the fact that the financial insurance and real estate sector was by far the greatest source of campaign contributions to federal candidates and parties, contributing almost half a billion dollars in the election cycle 2007-2008 alone. The financial services industry too often used its clout to lobby for government policies that ultimately hurt rather than benefited major financial firms. Classic 
was the way that Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac fought for years against more capable supervision and better capital standards that might have saved them from making the bad decisions that destroyed the two companies in 2008. The industry's political strength impeded other supervisory actions as well, such as the effort of regulators to try to limit excessive lending concentrations in non-traditional mortgages or commercial real estate. The question then becomes whether, from the perspective of organization and management, there's any major recommendation that, if well implemented, could have allowed more firms to survive. The literature on decision making in large organizations actually yields an answer. Sidney Finkelstein of the Tuck School of Business at Dartmouth and his colleagues analyzed decision making in large organizations. They found that bad decisions required two elements. First, an initial flawed decision that the CEO or another influential person made, and second, a poorly structured decision process that failed to provide facts and input to correct the mistake. To overcome this, good decision making requires what my book calls constructive dialogue. If I may borrow a felicitous phrase, feedback is a gift. Doubts and dissent need to be seen as offers to rethink a preliminary decision before it potentially causes harm.